we're going to read these next couple of page chapters here. This one's called What's Your Problem, Albert? Light from the hallway pours into my room as my mom opens the door. Hey, honey. Hey, I came in to check on you. You seemed very quiet at dinner tonight. Something going on? Mean kids at school. Oh, Allie Bug, I'm sorry you had to put up with that. What happened? Well, the kids who were mean? Yeah. I was kind of one of them. Oh, she says with a sigh. I'm surprised by that, Allie. Tell me what happened. Those girls who came into Peterson's that time? Well, they asked me to have lunch with them. I sat at their table, but then they started being mean to this kid named Albert about his clothes. I looked up into her eyes, and I went along with it. I feel bad about it. My mom brushes my forehead with her fingertips. You're not a little girl anymore, Allie, so it's not too soon to decide what kind of person you want to be. Of course, I know what kind of person you are, and I love you for it. She kisses me on the forehead. You made a mistake. Everyone does. Just do your best to make it right. That's all. The words, I'm sorry, are powerful ones. Yeah, okay. I'll make it right with him. That's my girl, she says, kissing my forehead one more time before leaving. The next morning at school, I'm wondering how I can make things right when, with Albert. I'm drawing a pigeon we, uh, wedging in my skateboard. I don't know that Keisha's standing behind me. You drew that? I move my arm to cover it. Why would you cover it? If, you, if I could draw like that, I'd put a commercial on TV about it. Thanks, I mumble. I don't know why I'm embarrassed, but I am. Keisha sits in her chair as I stare at her head full of thin braids, thinking it must take three days to do all that. So beautiful. I just love it. Not like my boring hair that just hangs there. I reach out to touch her hair. She turns towards me all of a sudden. What are you doing? Oh, I I'm, I'm sorry. There was a mosquito. Sometimes I can't believe the things I do. It's like my arm has its own brain. Uh-huh, Keisha says. Just then, Albert walks in and he looks upset. I want to be able to tell my mom that I made things right with him, so I go over. Albert, are you okay? I ask, wondering if he'll tell me to strap myself to a rocket and light the fuse. I have a problem. I'm sorry about the cafeteria thing, I blurted out. His eyebrows rise. That didn't bother me. No need to apologize. It didn't bother you to have a table full of people making fun of you? You're kidding. Why would I be kidding? Can it be that he really doesn't care what people think of him? We just stare at each other. If that didn't bother him at all, and this new problem does, then it must be really bad. Maybe it has to do with the bruises he has all the time. Can I help? I ask. No offense, but I don't really think so. Okay, I mumble. It's just a problem that I can't get out of my head. I feel like I won't be able to relax until I find an answer. Do you want to talk about it? I know sometimes when I have a problem, I talk it out with my brother or mom. Even if I don't find an answer, I feel better anyways. Well, I wait. I've just been wondering, if an insect is flying inside a moving train car, is it traveling faster than the train itself? And if the insect flies in the opposite direction that the train is moving in, is it then traveling more slowly than the train? Obviously, if the train or the fly is on the wall, it's moving at the same speed, as long as it isn't walking. But the movement within movement is a puzzle to me. Oh. He turns to me, a little intense. You can see the problem here. He doesn't ask. He tells. I know he doesn't really think I can help. Who knows if I could possibly figure out the science part of what he's talking about, but my mind shows me the insect in that train car. It's a dragonfly with brilliant greenish-blue wings and tiny goggles over its eyes. The car is old with dark wood walls and a dark green curtains, like from Grandpa's Westerns, and the people have old-fashioned clothes. I see them like they're new, like they're with me now. Some of the men are sleeping. One is waving the dragonfly off with a newspaper, not even noticing its tiny goggles. Ladies with the most beautiful dresses sit there too. And I see a girl who is with her mother, and her mother keeps asking the girl if she's enjoying the ride, and the girl keeps saying yes, being sure to have a happy-sounding voice. I don't know everything about that girl, but I do know that she is a lot more to worry about than an insect on a train. She doesn't fit in. She's all dressed up in fancy clothes and has to pretend to be someone she's not. She wants to muck around, help build fences. She wants to ride a horse the real way, not side saddle like her mother insists. When I come back from my mind movie, Albert has already walked away. But I don't care. I can't help thinking about the girl on the train and how she feels. Like she wants to do so much, but she's held back. And it makes her feel heavy and angry. Like she's dragging a concrete block around all the time. I like to help her break free from that. 
Chapter 13. Trouble with Flowers. It's the night of the holiday, holiday concert when we sing about Santa and dreidels and Kwanzaa. The best part is getting a new dress. I stand in front of the mirror, looking at my dress and my first shoes with heels on them, thinking about the shopping day I had with my mom. We even went to A.C. Peterson's for lunch. I like how she stayed with me in a booth instead of having to go wait on people. I love to sing, but I don't like our music teacher, Mrs. Muldoon. Max calls her Mindfield Muldoon because you can never tell when she's about to blow up over something. Oliver calls her that too, but he acts it, it out by leaping into the air yelling, Muldoon! As he lands on the floor and rolls. He doesn't stop though. He goes from rolls right to his feet again, like a cat in a cartoon. Shay is making fun of Albert because his clothes don't fit. What's with the pants, Albert? She says. Did you get that outfit in the third grade? Keisha whips around fast. Why do you always try to pull people down? She asks. Because some people deserve it. That's why. Shay answers. Deserve to be pulled down? Really? Keisha asks. Albert straightens his tie, which is the only part of his outfit that fits. He's even wearing his sneakers with the backs cut out. You know, he says. Logically, if a person wants to pull another down, it would mean that he or she is already below that person. Keisha lets out a laugh so loud that Mrs. Muldoon shoots her a look. Keisha covers her mouth and tries to squelch that sound. That is perfect, Albert. Man, you really are a smart dude. She turns to Shay. You, on the other hand, are so low, you could play tennis against a curb. Shay's eyes narrow before she can say anything. Mrs. Muldoon appears and tells us to line up. For the spring concert last year, before I had a growth spurt, I had to stand in the front row. I liked when Travis called me a dime among pennies. But this year, I get to stand toward the back of the line with the taller kids right next to Keisha. I look over at her. I love how she stuck up for Albert. She had the guts, and I didn't in the cafeteria. I wish I could be braver. We all stand, waiting to file in the auditorium. Oh, Mrs. Muldoon, I love your dress, Shay says. Mrs. Muldoon lights up like a bulb. Why, thank you, Shay. Your parents has raised such a nice young lady. Oh, thank you very much, Mrs. Muldoon. Shay smiles, but when she turns towards Jessica, she rolls her eyes and keeps glaring at Keisha. I decide I won't think about how mad she makes me, and I'll think instead about how all the girls get to carry a bouquet of flowers. That's the good news. The bad news is that they've been donated by Jessica's father, the florist. It's nice of him, but Jessica hasn't stopped bragging about it. Mrs. Muldoon walks down the line, handing out the most beautiful bouquets I've ever seen, like the ones that brides carry. Dark red ribbons that wind around the stem like a barber shop light pole. Ribbons dangle from the bottom, too. She hands my bunch to me, and I smile, thinking of how much my mom will love to see me with them. Keisha leans in to smell them and runs her fingers over the tops of the flowers. Then, one of the white buds falls off and bounces on the top of her tiny black shoe. Mrs. Muldoon is there in a second. What do you think you're doing? I just... Mrs. Muldoon grabs the flowers from Keisha's hands. Keisha looks up. No, please don't. I didn't mean... These flowers are a gift. And if that's how you're going to treat a gift with complete, relax of, uh, complete lack of respect and gratitude, then you, Keisha Allman, will be the only girl without flowers. But Mrs. Muldoon, Keisha says, I really didn't. Mrs. Muldoon holds up her hand like she's stopping traffic. I don't want to hear it. You will have no flowers, and perhaps you will remember in the future how a lady behaves. See, Shay says to Jessica, people do get what they deserve. I stand behind Keisha, but I wish I could see her face. I wait for her to say something back, but Keisha doesn't see anything. Although I can't see her cry, I can hear her sniff and see her brush her cheek with her fingertips. And I watch a mind movie of me being the only girl without flowers marching in to see all the parents and the look on my mom's face, how she'd be the only sad parent in a sea of smiling ones, and how I'd feel like I was less than everyone. No one should ever feel like that. I feel my fingertips dig into the center of my bouquet to separate the thick stems. It takes some twisting to work half the flowers out of the fancy ribbon, but I put some muscle into it. Stems crack and leaves and petals fall spinning in the air, landing all around my shiny new shoes. Mrs. Muldoon has turned around to stare. Her mouth is wide enough for a bird to build a nest. I hold her gaze as I hand half of my flowers to Keisha. Well, she can have some of mine then. In the end, neither of us had flowers when we walked into the auditorium, but we had bigger smiles than anybody else. <laughs>